Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to McKees Rocks Assembly of God in our virtual church. And um, we're glad to have everybody with us. A couple of housekeeping details to get us started, as is typical. Uh, obviously, the COVID-19 cases in the region as well as globally uh, continue to run high at this point. And uh, now a new and from what I uh, heard on a BBC report last night, uh, a more infectious uh, and uh, more infectious and more deadly strain has emerged of the the COVID virus. Now, the good news is, to this point, is to the best of my knowledge, the vaccine that is rolling out, which is on a positive note, that vaccine is still effective regardless of which strain is um, running amok among us. So uh, the, the board and I have agreed and that uh, it is in everyone's best interest at this point in time to continue with the virtual. We recognize that in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we have the liberty as a church to meet together, but it, out of an abundance of caution um, and with a consideration for everyone's well-being, uh, we've chosen to continue with the virtual uh, Sunday mornings for now. So stay tuned. We are uh, paying close attention, and uh, we long for the day when we can all get together here in the sanctuary again. Uh, uh, as always, a playlist of music was compiled for us, a link to which can be found on our website, mckeesrocksassembly.org. Um, or on Facebook or here in the chat on the YouTube channel this morning. Uh, it was a very encouraging uh, worship set for me personally, and I trust it will be encouraging for you uh, as well. So I encourage you to, uh, I, I said encourage four times in that one sentence, didn't I? Uh, but if you've not taken some time to worship the Lord this morning using that worship set, uh, do so after our time together here as we consider the Word of God. I do want to remind you about the donate button on our homepage. Uh, again, that's mckeesrocksassembly.org. And if you prefer, you can drop a check in the mail. I actually took a couple of them out of the mailbox this morning. Uh, that address is 835 Broadway, McKeesrocks, PA 15136. Either way, We'll make sure that your contributions are recorded in a timely fashion in the church books. Um, a special missions project that we've been highlighting is Light for the Lost. It's a, this is a National Assemblies of God program which provides evangelistic resources for missionaries and missionary partners through print, audio, video, and internet platforms. So, uh, next Sunday morning, January, 20, uh, January 31st, 2021, is National Light for the Lost Day. So uh, I'm asking that you prayerfully consider participating in this missions outreach. Um, you can just mark it on your check, or uh, if you happen to, to give your tithe or your offerings by cash, you can put it in an envelope and Mark it accordingly and, and get it to us here, and we'll make sure that those designated funds are appropriately um, applied. Um, so, uh, very exciting news that I'd like to share with you, and I believe I mentioned this last week, but Erica Robinson, um, a, a kidney donor, has been identified for Erica, and we're rejoicing with that family uh, about this. It is a living donor that is going to be providing that kidney. It's the best possible scenario for her. Um, the process is lengthy, and it's not going, the surgery isn't anticipated until June, but um, uh, the Pollard family has expressed their great appreciation for everybody's uh, support in this season, both financially and morally. Um, I will say that the financial need still exists. Um, the the uh, threshold that was uh, sought on the GoFundMe page was not met. Um, so if 
you are so inclined and interested in doing so, if you'd like to give toward that need, if you would just mark that on your check as well and send it here or bring it here or you could donate through the, uh, the web page, uh, that would work as well. And we want to continue to support this uh, wonderful family as they go through this season together. And we're excited with them that this donor has been identified. Uh, several Zoom events to highlight through the course of the week. Of course, we invite you for a brief time of fellowship after the service. Uh, Wednesday at 5.15 a.m., we continue our wonderful Wednesday wake-up worship. And this is uh, just a, a refreshing time of gathering together uh, at that hour of the morning. I've always loved early mornings. It's just, just something special about, it's something fresh about early mornings uh, in my mind and and for me personally. So join us 515 Wednesday morning. The link for each of these Zoom events is on our website, uh, mckeesrucksassembly.org. Um, Wednesday evening Bible study is also there. We've been back in the book of Romans now for a couple of weeks, and uh, that has been a, a good time of interaction uh, through the Zoom Bible study. For three years, we focused on the word that the Lord gave us at the end of 2017, that it's time to rebuild. We acknowledged the privilege that He's given us to be involved with Him in the work, to participate in the effort that He is putting forth to reach those in this community with the truth of the gospel and to incorporate some folks into the local church here that may be believers in Jesus Christ, but have not um, committed to a local church. And we believe that God has placed us here for the purpose of reaching this community. Uh, we began this year discussing the Christian dis discipline of fasting in preparation for our annual week of prayer. And two weeks ago, I introduced a new series entitled Preparing for the Post-Pandemic, looking at preparing our hearts by surrendering them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, whether Jesus is your personal Savior and Lord or not, uh, if He is not, that's the first step. Surrender to Him initially. If He is your Savior and Lord, perhaps there are areas in your life that need surrendered to Him yet. And so we spoke about that uh, quite a bit. And then last week, continuing in this series, we were looking at preparing our minds, and we wrapped up our time looking at Philippians 4.8, the final phrase of which says, dwell on these things, placing an exclamation point at the end of our preparing our minds for the post-pandemic. The final passage we considered, tying into the thought, was Romans 12.2, which says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, while the focus in looking at that passage was the renewing of our minds, the ultimate goal is a transformed life. Our minds are being renewed by the Word of God, but the, the transformational process moves from our minds to our entire being. And as we look to the Lord for the new, renewing of our minds and the transforming of our lives in our preparing for the post-pandemic, let us be found preparing our practice for the post-pandemic. Father, this morning, as we've gathered together, in this virtual room, first of all, we thank you for the technology that exists today in this season, this pandemic season, for the technology that has been made available and, and that we can use to, to stay connected as your church here at 835 Broadway. God, I pray that you would speak by your Spirit and through your Word to my heart and to the hearts of all of your people that view this video, most of all, Father, be glorified in and through us. And we'll thank you 
and praise and honor you as you do it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So preparing our practice for the post-pandemic. The final part of Romans 12, 2 states, So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Herein is the goal of the transformation of our minds by the Word of God. It's not just our thinking will change, so our perspective will change, though they do, and they will as we yield to God's work in us. Our thinking and our perspective changes because the Word of God changes our mind and transforms our thinking. So we see things differently. And, and I can tell you that after all the years that I've walked with the Lord, that even this very passage itself, as I was considering it in our preparation for this morning, my perspective of this very passage changed. And I saw it from a, a fresh angle because of what God is doing in me and in my mind. The ultimate goal, the end game, if you will, is that we will prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, the one perspective that I viewed this from in the past is that we discover, we, we uncover, we see uh, what the will of God is. But there's another side to this. There's another side to this that we're going to look at in just a minute. You know, God chose the nation of Israel not because they were more numerous or more righteous than other nations or by any other measure were they deserving of His choice of them. So too, that same template drops over us. None of us deserve the free gift of eternal life that we've been given in Jesus Christ. There's not a soul alive, a soul that has ever lived, that deserves the free gift of eternal life that has come through Jesus. Romans 3.23 tells us clearly, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we need a Savior to redeem us from that sin. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, By grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast. There's not an individual in heaven that can boast before God that they got there on their their own merit. No man, woman, or human being that has ever lived, man, woman, or child that is in the presence of God for eternity can boast that they've earned it in being there on their own. God chose Israel that they might be witnesses to all other nations as they were to Pharaoh in Egypt. And the, the, the focus of their witness, or their, the, the, what they were witnessing to, is the one true living God that is superior, that is the only one true living God. And in Exodus chapter 7, the Lord said to, the, to Moses, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt, and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. And something that you may or may not be aware of, you may be familiar with all of the plagues that God poured out and all of the, the things that God did uh, through Moses in the context of what that passage, where that passage is written. But what you might not be aware of is each and every one of those plagues that God poured out through Moses as he looked to get the people of Israel out of Egypt, each and every one of those plagues targeted one of the false gods that the Egyptians embraced. So in attacking and defeating and uh, showing his superiority in each and every aspect of what God did as the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, he proved to Pharaoh and anyone who was willing to see that all of the gods, quote unquote, that they served were nothing compared to the God of Israel. We, like Israel, 
have been made God's people so that we might be witnesses of who He is revealed in Jesus. So we are to prove the will of God, what the will of God, that which is perfect. And that we prove it by the lives that we live as He transforms us from who we were to who He has created us to be. To, to, to fashion us into the image of His Son. As that takes place in our lives, we prove what the will of God is, that He has created us to be conformed into the image of His Son. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the second part of that verse, it says, You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Look at what it says. It doesn't say you might be. It doesn't say you could be if you so desire. It says you shall be. As we've been born again by the Spirit of God, as He comes and lives inside of us, as we surrender our hearts and our minds and our wills to Him, He transforms us and we are then witnesses of who He is and what He has done and what He desires to do in each and every person that has ever lived and ever walked this planet. Ah, oh, what a marvelous privilege we've been given, folks. What a marvelous opportunity we've been given to represent the God who has redeemed us from who we were. We today, like those Paul addressed at the church in Ephesus, there in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, we were formerly darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Ah, oh, Thank you, Jesus, that we're light in the Lord. We're no longer in darkness. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus said of those who follow him, you are the light of the world. If you've got someone in the room with you that's a fellow believer, look at them and say, you're a light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are here to shine the light of the gospel, the truth of who God is to the world around us. We're a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but puts it on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Look at what he says. Let your light shine before men. And how does that light shine? How is that light evidence? How is that light proof of the will of God? As they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now those good works are not done out of our own effort, but as God brings them about in and through us. He sets up the opportunity and we walk in it. Paul recognized his role as an example to be followed. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, it says, The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things. Paul recognized that he had to be a role model. I'll tell you, as a pastor, it is a sobering and weighty thing to recognize that I am responsible for everyone to whom I speak in these moments, in these seasons. But beyond that, my very life is under scrutiny. And like Paul, I am called to be an example, a higher level of an example because of the role that God has called me to occupy. But each and every one of us, brother, sister, fellow Christian, is called to be an example, evidence, proof of what is the good and perfect will of God as He transforms us, as He works through us in the lives of those around us. Paul said, look at me. 
follow me as I follow Christ. As a pastor, I stand in this pulpit this morning and I say, look at me, follow me as I follow Christ. When you see the warts, when you see the wrinkles, when you see the failures, recognize that I'm human. Pray for me that I overcome. But then follow me as I follow Christ. That should be our declaration, folks. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 16, he says, Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. Friends, I pray that you find in me something worth imitating that reflects the cross of Christ. Paul declared it boldly. I declare it to you humbly, and I pray that there is something found in me that you can emulate in following after Christ. Paul knew he had been given a stewardship, a responsibility from God to preach the gospel, but he also recognized his personal inability to fulfill that stewardship in his own strength. And I submit to you that I recognize that as well. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surprising greatness of the power of God will... Uh, wait a minute. So the surprising greatness of the power of God Will I'm sorry, I keep reading it wrong. So that the surprising greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves, not from ourselves. Paul further recognized his fulfillment of the stewardship went far beyond mere words. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. 1 Corinthians 4.20, he says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. You know, Ron and I were talking offline as we were preparing for the video this morning, and we were talking about the, the value and benefit of gathering together as a church and, and the, the opportunity, the greater opportunity that that presents for the gifts of the Spirit to be in operation and for the Spirit of God to move in real and tangible ways that are more palpable because we are in the same room together. Oh, I long for that time again when that can happen and when we can experience the manifestation of the power of God in real and tangible ways. Now, like Moses and Paul, we don't have to depend on our own ability or our own strength. In fact, if we do, we'll fail and we will fall short of revealing and declaring the perfect will of God. In Exodus, God used Moses far beyond his own strength and ability, supernaturally reaching out his hand in the presence of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He did all of these marvelous works. Moses was the instrument. He was the, the touch point, if you will, between Pharaoh and the people of Egypt and the God that sent Moses, and so are we. Paul recognized he, and we are but earthen vessels. Yet he relied on the power of God manifest through him. And as I stand before you today, I submit to you that week in and week out, as I stand behind this pulpit, I rely, and as I go to work at the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, I rely on the power of God to equip me and enable me to do what he's called me to do. And you might say, well, that's good for you, Pastor. You're a pastor. You're a preacher. You've got to do these things. Listen. Monday through Friday, eight to nine hours a day, I serve God by serving at the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority as a fleet and contract administrator. 
one of the things that I do in that role is I use spreadsheets to provide statistics, to provide analysis of various different things. Just this past week, and if you doubt the veracity of my statement, I'll give you my wife's phone number. <laughs> and you can call her and she can confirm it. Send us an email and she'll tell you by email. But I was looking to accomplish something in a spreadsheet. I, I discovered that I had hard-coded some information in previously and that that information had now gotten stale. So I was looking for a way to automate that particular function in the spreadsheet. Now, I understand that these things are possible, but I don't understand how to do them all. And I did some scratching and I did some digging and I tried to figure it out and I was unsuccessful and I prayed. I, I literally, pastor, you're being ridiculous. Maybe so, but I'll tell you what. I prayed, and within 30 minutes, I figured out how to provide that formula in that spreadsheet. So if anyone picks that thing up years from now and still uses that same tool, although I doubt they will, that formula will still provide accurate, up-to-date results. Our God is a practical God. He really is. He will help you in whatever area of life you need assistance. He will work through you to prove what the good and perfect will of God is for the lives of those around us. In reading chap, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a moment ago, I intentionally left out part of that verse. In, in the first part of that verse, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. God has sent His Spirit to mankind. In the last days, the Scripture says, He will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. And He did it that day of Pentecost. When He poured forth of the Holy Spirit, and He's been doing it ever since, filling, baptizing people in this precious gift, the power of the Holy Spirit to live this life. I stand before you today and I declare to you honestly and truthfully, I am convinced that if it weren't for the power and the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I would not still be here. But He's kept me. He's empowered me and He will do the same. He's no respecter of persons. He will provide you with that very same power to overcome in this life. An ancient promise to a leader of the Jews returning from captivity in Babylon to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem is one which we today can cling to based on Jesus' promise. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, a very familiar passage to many people, particularly those in the Pentecostal church, it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We were called to rebuild the church of, that God desires to have here at Ninth and Broadway, can and must rely on the power of the Spirit of God. We can't do it in our own strength. Romans 8, 11 says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. As we live, we walk, and depend on the power provided by the Holy Spirit, we can do so in such a way as to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, that I've continued to refer to throughout this time together, and as is stated that specifically, that plainly, that clearly, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. By relying on the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can fulfill the stewardship God has entrusted to us as spelled out by Paul in Ephesians chapters 4 and 5. Let me be abundantly clear here for you. We're not outlining a list of do's and don'ts. We're not outlining a list of 
mandates and requirements and things that must be accomplished in order for us to, to declare that we're Christians. What I am saying to you today is that God has called us to be His people. He has saved us by His power through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And He has delineated in His Word those things that He will bring about in and through us as we yield to Him and we surrender our lives to Him. He will bring these things about. And in doing so, He will prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God among men. He'll do it through you, friend. He'll do it through me. Some of you are standing there shaking your head. Some of you are saying, maybe not out loud, but in your heart and in your mind, you're saying, there's no way that can happen. Nothing is impossible with God. If we will but say, yes, Lord, nothing is impossible with God. Ephesians chapter 4 Verses 1 through 3 says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, Paul refers to himself here as the prisoner of the Lord. He may have been in a literal physical prison as placed there by the Romans, but his prisonership was not physical. His prisonership was voluntary. He was a prisoner of the Lord. He had surrendered his will. He had surrendered his life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he, he declared himself as a prisoner of the Lord, and he did so joyfully. I submit to you, there's no place I'd rather be than in the prison of the Lord. Under his control, under his governance, there's no better place to live. You might say, well, I'm, I'm a free person. I want to do what I want to do. Yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Because there's joy in the presence of the Lord. There's nothing, nothing like walking with Jesus. The word therefore in that passage that begins that passage points back to two considerations in the previous chapter. In that chapter, Paul recognized his responsibility to preach the gospel and to lead the early church, as I've already indicated earlier. Because of this recognition, he here implores his readers to heed his instructions. In my years as a pastor, there have been times where I have implored people. I have strongly encouraged people. I've done everything that I know to do to convince people that this is the way. Walk in it. And Paul is doing the same thing here. He is imploring his readers to heed his instructions. Regrettably, I know that there were those that rejected Paul's instructions, so I don't feel so bad. Well, I do feel bad. But at least I'm in good company when people reject my instructions as a pastor. You are in good company, friend, when people reject your instructions according to the Word of God. The second consideration that Paul points to from the previous chapter is God's enablement of them and us to live in the way that God calls us. So first there's the call, the instruction, the mandate to go and do these things. But secondly is the promise, the assurance of the enablement that God will provide to accomplish the things that He's given us to do. He summarizes this enablement in Ephesians 3.20 referring to Him who is able to do far abundantly, far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. I've heard a lot of people quote this passage looking to get God to do something for them, but what, he, what 
that Paul is actually speaking of is what God is going to do within us, and then as He does it within us, He will do it through us for the benefit of others around us. He then begins to define what it means to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, as stated there in verse 2. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another there in Ephesians 4.2. With all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. First, let me clarify that the calling with which you have been called is not a reference to full-time vocational ministry. Rather, he is referring to being believers in Jesus Christ, having responded to the drawing of the Holy Spirit, as seen in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where it refers to those who are called according to His purpose. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have been called according to God's purpose, and you've responded to that call. And the words that Paul is declaring here apply to you and to me. Humility is the first portion of Paul's definition as this humility is foundational as to how we should be found living our lives for Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7 says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Jesus is God, and he came as God incarnate, yet he was willing to set aside his divine prerogatives and walk in this earthly human body. He did not, he emptied himself, verse 7 says, and taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in proper time. Oh, Pastor, I've been humbling myself for a long time. God hasn't exalted me yet. If it doesn't happen in this life, <laughs> there's a glory awaiting you in eternity that will make whatever you endure in this life, it will outstrip the worst humbling that you had to experience in this life as you enjoy the glory of God for eternity. Gentleness is the, the second thing that Paul mentions there. And this is a trait that is often mistaken as weakness. He refers to gentleness and meekness and uh, weak, uh, gentleness and meekness are often mistaken as weakness in our society. But here Paul declares this as being Christ-likeness as he presents his modeling of it there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. He declares, I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Listen, meekness and gentleness are not weakness. They are actually power under control. That's what true meekness and gentleness is. They are power under control. The power is there. It could be exercised, but by gentleness and meekness, an individual who is yielded to the Spirit of God restrains that power and doesn't exercise that power. Paul goes on to mention patience. Patience, something which most of us have no patience to develop. We are impatient to develop patience. The, the joke has been made, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. Yeah, mm, yeah, patience. 
Many of you were laughing because that was you or is you. Maybe it's you today. You know, the old saying among Christians, though not necessarily biblical, is if you pray for patience, expect trials. It's not necessarily the case. You know, I'm not superstitious. I don't believe God is that whimsical that, that He's going to just give us trials because we prayed for patience. He might permit us to go through trials to develop our patience, but it's not necessarily going to be because we prayed and asked for patience. Rounding out Paul's list here in verse 2 is showing tolerance for one another in love. Showing tolerance for one another in love. We live in a society today where all too often the call for tolerance is made most loudly by those who themselves are intolerant of anyone who disagrees with them. What a hypocritical thing. The call for tolerance when they themselves are intolerant of others. To be clear, as an examination of his other writings would bear out, Paul is not calling for tolerance of sinful behavior. What he is calling for is tolerance of spiritual immaturity and personality differences which exist among even the most committed of Christians. If you find yourself being intolerant or writing somebody in the body of Christ off, brother, sister, I suggest to you that it's time that you come to a place of repentance. Because Paul has called for us to be tolerant of others in the body of Christ. Notice who he refers to. He says, be tolerant of one another. Showing tolerance For one another. The one another there is clearly a reference to other members in the body of Christ. If we can't be tolerant of those in the body of Christ who are less than what they should be, how tolerant are we going to be of the sinners around us that need Jesus? Or are we going to get all high and mighty and self righteous and dismissive of them? May God help us to learn tolerance, not of sin. Not of sinful behavior. Elsewhere in the Scriptures, in the New Testament, Paul calls out individuals who are engaged in sinful activity. He plainly calls them out. But when they come to repentance, he also, in the book of Corinthians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, you see this. There was an individual who was in in the vilest of sin. He had his father's wife as a lover. Paul condemned his activity and, and, and denounced it. But when he repented, he urged the church at Corinth to welcome the man back. So, yes, we expose sin. We need to do that for the well-being of the individual engaged in it. But we need also be tolerant of those who are not engaged in sin, but simply have human frailties. Who here has human frailties? If you didn't put your hand up, you need to repent of arrogance and pride. I'm just saying. You're being intolerant, Pastor. No, I'm trying to help you. We're all human. We all have those weaknesses. We all have those spiritual immaturities and personality quirks that rub somebody else the wrong way. It seems worthy of note that most of the characteristics listed here are repeated by Paul in his letter to the church at Galatia. They're also referring to them as the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Remember how I said these things are not what we work up. We don't accomplish these in our own strength. It's the Spirit of God working in us and through us that brings them about. And there in Galatians chapter 5, verses 20 through 22 through 23, they are referred to as the fruit of of the Spirit. Fruit is a natural growth produced by a tree. And fruit of the Spirit is the natural growth that takes place in the life of a believer in Jesus Christ as we surrender our lives to the work of the Spirit of God in us. He brings them about. We don't have to work them up. We don't have to 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 accomplish them. It's not things we check off of our to-do list. These are things that God brings about in us. 
Oftentimes we in the Pentecostal church look to those that speak in tongues or work miracles or prophesy or, or, or are given words of knowledge or words of wisdom or oh, how mature they are when that's the furthest thing from the truth. The fruit of the Spirit is the measure of maturity. And the fruit of the Spirit there, defined by Paul in Galatians chapter 5, is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And he says, against such things there is no law. If we are walking this thing out, if we are manifesting these fruit, then there is no law to judge us because the fruit of the Spirit is evident in and through us. Paul continues his definition of walking in a worthy manner in verse 3. He says, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It seems significant that Paul would call for diligence, an indicator that extra effort is required here. We've got to apply ourselves. While the Spirit of God will do these things in and through us, we have got to apply ourselves in walking them out. If there is unity nowhere else in society today, there should be unity in the church which is governed by the Holy Spirit. We should be walking together in love, in the unity, in the body of Christ, those who are led by the Spirit of God. Pastor David Guzik observes in his commentary, God never commands us to create unity among believers. He has created it by His Spirit, and our duty is to recognize it and to keep it. It's been my privilege to be connected to a number of different churches over the years who came together despite their denominational or organizational uniqueness and distinctiveness. Some who are not part of a larger group, but are just a local body that is autonomous and, and self-determining. Others that are part of a, a well-defined uh, denomination, if you will. Others that are part of a, a more loosely knit fellowship. Yet, we got together as pastors. I remember gathering together with a group of men that prayed on a regular basis. Men of God that loved the Lord and, and just... It didn't matter what organization we were from. It's been my privilege to see this in action. And oh, I long to see it on a larger scale because it's what God has created. It's what He's birthed. It's what He's called us to be and to do. And in doing so, we prove what is the will of God. Unity in the community. Unity in the church. In an article in Relevant Magazine that was sent to me this week. The following statement was made which addresses a recent and perhaps lingering source of disunity in the body of Christ. This is a little bit on the nose, but I think it's on the nose if you catch my double meaning. The article says, For whom... Do I feel greater affection? People who agree with my politics but don't share my faith? Or people who share my faith but don't agree with my, with my politics? If it's the first instead of the second, we may be rendering unto Caesar what belongs to God and that can't be a good thing. Brother, sister, Christian, if a separation has come between you and fellow members of the body of Christ over political ideals and positions and opinions, it's time to repent of allowing that thing 
to cause disunity because the body of Christ will last for all eternity. Republicans and Democrats will fade away and disappear. As we prepare for the post-pandemic this morning, we've begun to consider what has turned out to be a multi-week look at preparing our practice. Do you know Jesus today? Is He Lord and Savior of your life? If He's not, it's, it's really a simple matter. It doesn't require being here in a sanctuary. It doesn't require any great effort. You don't have to complete an application. There's no. All it requires is recognizing that you're a sinner separated from God. Recognizing that you need a Savior and that that Savior is Jesus Christ and that He died on the cross to pay for your sin and calling upon Him receiving Him as Savior and Lord, inviting Him in to take control of your life. Just pray a simple prayer and say, God, I recognize I'm separated from You. Jesus, come and take control of my life. And you, my friend, if you pray that prayer, have been born again by the Spirit of God and are now a follower of Jesus Christ. Commit to serve Him. Is God stirring your heart today? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, is God stirring your heart today for a greater level of preparation for the post-pandemic? This morning, has He shined a bright spotlight on a characteristic of Christ-likeness which He wants to improve in you? As we listen once again this morning, to our theme song for this year, See This Vessel. Join with me in making it your prayer and declare to God, Father, see this vessel. See this Vessel, Lord, waiting to be filled. See this vessel, Lord, waiting to be used by you. See this vessel, Lord, waiting to be filled. See this vessel, Lord, waiting to be used by you. Set aside to do your will. Oh, holy life, acceptable to you, purchased by the blood you spilled on Calvary's hill. See this vessel, Lord, wait. To be filled, see this vessel, Lord, waiting to be used by you. Oh, use me now, show me how, use my hands, but let it be your word. Oh, more of you and less of me. You can use my words, but let it be your word. See 
your church, O oh Lord, waiting to be filled. See your church, O oh Lord, waiting to be used by you. Oh, use us now, show us how. Use our hands, but let it be your work. Oh, more of you and less of us. You can use our voice, but let it be your word. See this vessel, Lord, waiting to be filled. See this vessel, Lord, waiting to be you. Willing to be used, needing to be used by you. Father, we thank you for your hand on our lives. I thank you for this time together again this morning. Lord, our heart's cry is that you would see us, your vessels, looking to be used by you, longing to be used by you, needing, my God, to be used by you. But not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of those around us, that your good and perfect will would be manifest to those in this community, those in our homes, those in our families, those in our workplaces. For the glory and honor and praise of your name, bring it about, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. Hope to see you uh, Wednesday worship or after the service here in a moment or Wednesday night Bible study on Zoom. McKeesRocksAssembly.org. The Lord bless you. Have a great day.